bow when you cough or sneeze. Choose Dex Soap for that extra cleanliness. Dex Soap is affordable and available nationwide. It is now 19 hours 30 all across this beautiful country that we call Guyana and it is time to enter room 592 where we unleash the truth. We have been going on for the past 5 months and it's a familiar face, Dr. Yog Mahadio at the helm of this evening's program. Welcome sir, alongside his loyal co-host, senior journalist of Kaitra News, Mr. Leonard Gildari. Good evening, gentlemen. Yes, good evening there, you're Yog, you're true, you're hearing us? Yes, uh, Yog says he's not here, and our apologies there, while we're trying to make our connections, you know, this is one of the things. Yog hasn't been paying his phone bill, but that's okay. I I haven't had to stay pay my phone bill, you know what I mean? I can hear you, and I came in right on time to hear that comment, Leonard. Don't worry, how are you, my, my friend? Uh, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. You know, you know what? Uh, I didn't say that of my own. Own the boys in the studio pushed me towards that, and I, I they said they're gonna cut us off if I don't say it. So I gotta protect the show. So I I did what I had to do. Great. Well, let me say a warm welcome to you, my co-host, and a good evening to Kevin Smith and everybody there at the studio. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you're joining us from, welcome to Room 592, where we unleash the truth. And we are, we will be joined by no other than our Honorable Minister, Gail Teixeira, in a couple of moments. She is, she is running a, a tight schedule, as you know, and so she will be joining us uh, very shortly. But in the meantime, Leonard, um, there are some matters that I wanted you and I want to share with our viewers and listeners. Ladies and gentlemen, Room 592, um, we would like to appeal to everyone. Three persons have died in a horrible, horrible accident up at the East Coast this afternoon. Please take your time in using the roadways. If, you, if you're in a hurry, you know, please, uh, it, it's, it's, it's better you take some time. It's better you are late. It's better to be late than never be there at all. And so we would like to express our condolences and sympathies to the families of those who have passed on. And we'd like to call upon all the drivers, all those who are driving on the Guyana roads, please be careful. Leonard, at some stage, we'll have to have the traffic chief in room 592 to have a discussion with him as well. So we wanted to express that sympathy to the family of those who have passed on. And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, there are also some other stuff that I want to quickly share with you all tonight. Um, Leonard, guess what? Uh, it's a proud moment for the Caribbean in terms of two things would have happened. Trinidadian elections are over. We know that there are some uh, requests, demands for recount and the recount is ongoing. Dr. Keith Rowley, um, he had a, an interesting interview on, on, on the CNC3 um, um, television program earlier today. And you know he took in calls from the public, and he basically I, I heard that program myself, and he basically referred to the UNC's request for a recount as the Guyanization of of the Trinidadian elections. I saw that, that not, Yog, I yeah. saw that. My apologies, man. And I was telling yeah. Glenn, I was telling Glenn that is something that I'm not very proud about. Um, that this is uh, I, I don't like it when any other countries, whether it's in jest or otherwise, in this particular case, I think that he was using Guyana as a clear example and he has a right to do that. But uh, when we put ourselves in a position that others could look at, uh, look at us, frown on us and, uh, and make us as examples, uh, in this particular case, case is not very flattering. So I was extremely upset about that uh, because we have placed ourselves in that position. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. and, and Leonard, so, so it is not a flattering comment. He mentioned it twice on the program, actually, once he asked the, the interview, uh, interviewer that you, you, you see what happened in Guyana. And then later on, he said that, you know, the process to the courts and so forth is the Guyanization of the Trinidadian elections. Now, each country has its own unique problems, but, you know, we didn't look in good light there at all. Ladies and gentlemen, there's another thing that has happened. Well, it's a proud moment for us in the Caribbean. Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. has been announced as a running mate of Joe Biden. As you may know, you may know, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who don't, please know now. And you can say you heard it from Room 592. Kamala Harris. Kamala means lotus flower. And how did I know this? In her own memoir in 2019, titled The Truths We Hold, no other than Kamala Harris says my name must be pronounced in the following manner, and it means lotus flower. It's a proud moment because of our Caribbean roots, and of course, you know, um, without, without having any tinge of, of, of racism here, I just want to acknowledge too, it feels good to have a person of color occupying some of the senior most positions in the world. We know where we have come from, and it is good. It, it's generally a good feeling, Leonard, isn't it? Aren't you proud? Well, the thing is, uh, when you say person of color, you say all of us in one boat. And how yes. long? And let me tell you what you, you what you've said there, uh, Yog, is so very significant. Instead of us referring to ourselves as Indians and Blacks or Amerindians or Afro Guyanese, I would like us to just simply say we're all Guyanese. And so, all what right. you've said there, if you're not white, you're black or you're colored, <laughs> and let us get it very, very clear. But it is indeed she's Caribbean, and we're proud of that. Mm -hmm. We are very proud. And so that's a big news coming out of over this weekend from the U.S., of course, where Kamala Harris is the running mate for Joe Biden. And ladies and gentlemen, the other uh, another piece of, uh, of, well, call it good news. Um, uh, you can also call it a little bit of, of, of um, not so good news. As we know, coronavirus continues to, to have its way with our Guyanese population, the numbers are going up and up and up. So that's not good. The good news about that all is that it's control. It's totally in our hands, ladies and gentlemen. We control where the coronavirus will be spread or not. And Leonard, I must say hats off to Roy B. Pat. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the, the Giftland cinemas are scheduled to be reopening um, sometime, hopefully by uh, weekend coming, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that, why I raise this, Leonard, I raise it from the following perspectives, ladies and gentlemen. The, the uh, Giftland cinemas will be reopening. However, it's only reopening, taking all of the COVID-19 restrictions in place. They're going to have, they're, they're, they're saying that they're going to have uh, acrylic, um, acrylic, uh, uh, front for their boots, and they're going to have the, 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 the number of persons that will go into any of the cinemas will be reduced. They're going to insist people wear face masks. Um, their, their own patron, the employees are going to be wearing face masks all the time. Um, there'll be hand sanitizing stations around the lobby area. Clients will find signage with new guidelines. So they are going to have the protocols in place. And so, Leonard, you know, look, uh, President Ali mentioned it. Um, to his credit, uh, President Granger had mentioned it a little while back, that at some stage, the government of Guyana has to now look at re-energizing the economy, notwithstanding COVID. And so it's good to see businesses are putting protocols in place to ensure that the economy can continue to run, employees to be paid, bills to be paid, while ensuring that people can get to get to, to, to enjoy what they would normally want to enjoy, Leonard. Yes, I, I, I would, um, but I'm not sure, Yog, while I, I want to see a restarting and things like that, uh, we have to, uh, I, I, I want to be assured as, as a citizen that uh, there are going to be these strict protocols. It has to be extremely strict. And I say that in the background. Look what happened, um, this announcement today uh, by uh, President Irfan Ali that uh, one member of his cabinet, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Yuk Todd, has been tested positive for coronavirus. And then you saw photographs uh, surfacing of 
all of the cabinet members uh, being tested. That's one. Two, they are going to be ordered to work from home. But it is very clear that this is something, one, it is not uh, going to go away, uh, that anybody could get it, whether you're a minister or not, uh, you are going to get it. Uh, so that means we have to start re-looking at some of our cavalier attitude. That's one. The second thing is, uh, I, I agree with you what you say, that we have to do something to jumpstart back this economy as to whether we have the discipline to do it, that's another thing. So I would want to say, you know, let's continue the origin. The government and the authorities would have to ensure that, like, the movie theaters, and so while we need these things and while we dearly miss them, uh, they, they, there has to be strict, very, very strict uh, measures in place. And you're right, with all these uh, 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 facilities that they're going to put up to ensure that there's distance between you and the other folks and limiting the number of persons, it is going to be needed. But uh, there's so many other things, um, like the, close, the opening of bars right next to police stations mm -hmm. and enforcement. Enforcement is a key thing, Yoga. Correct, correct. And remember, remember, ladies and gentlemen, while we await, uh, you know, the, the um, company of our Honorable Minister Gail Teixeira tonight, we want to share these things with you and the Gail Teixeira will be here any moment. Let me just ensure that we set the perspectives right. Um, you know, Kamala Harris of, of Caribbean roots, basically, Indo-Caribbean roots, that is, or I think the father is from Jamaica, or, or fa which one, Leonard, did I get it right? One is from Jamaica, uh, the father or something is from Chennai, India, but one parent is Jamaica, one is from India. So the Caribbean roots would have been there. She's American born, of course. Um, and then, of course, we talk about the COVID in the country. It was also good to hear from Dr. Frank Anthony um, the last time we had Room 592, two days ago, Leonard, about what's happening with COVID. And, of course, it's not so good news that the, minister, the new minister of foreign affairs um, has contracted the coronavirus disease. And so all the ministers have been advised to work from remote uh, locations to not be in contact with persons. First of all, I believe that the entire um, cabinet have all ensured that they went and got themselves tested and retested today. And they have immediately started uh, contact tracing. Thank you, she Shelly Jetu. Yes, the father is from Jamaica and mother is India. Um, so thank you for that, uh, for that uh, information. Ladies and gentlemen, um, with regards to the opening of the business and opening of the communities, please be reminded that the coronavirus disease, um, it, it's up to you and I to, to stop it, to restrict its spread. And as rightly pointed out by someone, a cinema is an enclosed environment, but if these businesses are reopening, you have to wear your mask. Ladies and gentlemen, as we have said over and over, the responsible behavior for stopping coronavirus disease is, is with us. It's with every person in this country. And I see we are joined by the Honorable Minister. Minister, welcome to Room 592. You're, you're muted. We are not hearing you. Sorry. There, thank you. Uh, Yoga and, and Leonard and, and all your viewers, thank you very much for having me on your program. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you, Minister. And I, I know you are, you look very good, I must say, notwithstanding <laughs> you having some tough, tough days. Uh, you know, I know you just got in, so our thanks for joining us. And Minister, let's get right into it. It's been a week and a half of the new government. And if you don't mind giving us, um, what's your feel, what's the take? Like, I know there's been a lot of things said about the political appointees. We'll get to that in a moment. But what's been the general feel of the new government now that you are there for a week and a half? Well, I've said that, as uh, President Irfan Ali said, that we're going to be running out of the blocks at a, at a fast pace. At a, we're going to be going at a, 100 miles an hour. And uh, that's certainly what's happening. Uh, the new ministers are discovering their, their ministries. We're trying to streamline everything, as you know. Um, it's been like being on Discovery Channel, you know, um, <laughs> when you're on Discovery Channel, you're not sure you're going to see for that day. And uh, so every day is a new discovery, whether in my ministry, in my sector, whether it's in someone else's sector. Um, whatever we thought that was going on in the government and what was the state of the economy and the preparations for COVID, 
you can multiply that about a hundred to a thousand times of how much worse it is than what we thought. And so um, it, it's, it's been uh, fascinating actually, but um, quite, uh, quite uh, disturbing some of the things we've discovered and um, the challenges we face. But I'm very confident that uh, we're gonna do this. We have the will to do it and we have the capacity to do it as well. It just is not gonna happen overnight, but it will happen much faster than the last five years. Thank you. And Minister, you hold a very interesting portfolio. I would not envy you there at all. Governance and parliamentary affairs, of course. Yeah. Governance is as big as the country, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and and well, so it's, it's I, a lot of areas. I guess the book will stop with you, right? <laughs> no, the book will stop with the president and the cabinet, but um, I am just a, a cog in the wheel and hopefully a cog that doesn't hold things up but allow things to move forward. Right. But governance important issues to do with human rights and and um, as well as electoral reform, constitutional reform, um, as well as our, our international obligations, our treaty obligations, anti-corruption and so on. So parliamentary affairs, uh, there's a nice link between parliamentary affairs and governance. And uh, based on our manifesto and the, the things we've said that we want to ensure that we're running a modern democratic nation um, it also means that a lot of the legislative agenda would not be, um, I'd be managing it. The cabinet will set, of course, what its leg legislative agenda is, but I would be managing the government's legislative agenda in the parliament. Mm -hmm. And so some things I'm fascinated with, um, my, my former president, Mr. Jack, yeah. he always teased me about how I love parliament. <laughs> and so he's right in that way. I do love it. I love the sparring and I love the preparations and to see uh, change come forward through legislative means. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I have to still um, set up my ministry. Mine is a new ministry. Mm -hmm. um, when we were in government prior to 2015, we'd set up a, a governance unit in the office of the president. And that was completely dismantled in the last five years. So now we're graduating from what was a unit that did quite a lot of work with a little staff to now being a ministry. So it's been given much more, what you call a focus and attention as well as budgetary support. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm looking forward to it. Of course, I'm starting from scratch. And so right. uh, I'll end up being a bit of a one woman show for a little while, hopefully not too long. <laughs> Well, well, I think a lot of Guyanese have faith in you and your, your capabilities to handle it. And Minister, let me just say this before we get into more of our um, uh, discussion tonight. You are one of the persons in the PPP that has the distinction of, of, um, of having been close with not just the former president, but basically with all of the PPP presidents, yes. you have the distinction yes. of having been very close to Teddy Jagan himself. Yes, yes. I mean, I was his personal secretary from 1977 to 1992, and then became a minister in his government in 1992. And so I worked very closely at the party headquarters, like many people like Rohi, uh, Clement Rohi, Donald Ramatar, uh, we were that older group. Um, well, we were very young then, we were in our twenties, but now we're not so young. Um, right. But uh, yeah, so I work with uh, Chedi, I work Chedi Jagan, Sam Hines for that period as president then right. Janet Hagan, then Mr. Jack Deo and Mr. Ramatara, and now again with a brand new president, Irfan Ali. And it's a great honor to serve my country and to serve in a PVPC government. Correct. And Minister, this, uh, th this little bit of housekeeping. So before this last election, you would have given up um, your, your, um, your, your uh, dual citizenship, did you? Yeah. Yes, I did. Um, Do I you see know... Someone I see somebody uh -huh. writing that I didn't, I did. And it was publicly uh, announced when I did. I remember that it was publicly announced. Do you know whether the same holds true for persons that will be filling the opposite seats in parliament? Hmm. Um, I, all I know there's a court order and the, the court ruling is very clear. Um, first of all, nobody should have been on the list of candidates for any party that had dual citizenship of any kind. And therefore, if they have um, been silent on this and it's discovered, um, they can be removed if they go into parliament, actually, mm -hmm. um, because now there's a court record. I mean, I have my suspicions, but I have no proof. 
on, and it depends on who the parties select. I noticed Mr. Granger said what I thought was an odd thing, um, although he says a number of odd things, of course, but I mean, in this regard, and that was uh, pointing, he said, I think it was on Sunday or Saturday, that the criteria for the selection of their MPs from the list had to do with citizenship. And I thought that was a very odd statement because this should have been resolved before you put in your list. Of course. So that uh, if you're looking at your list, then you are assuming that all those who are on your list are declared to at least the party leaders or to the general secretaries or the representative the list that they're not a citizen and therefore sign the uh, the oath that you have to sign. So I thought it was very funny that maybe there are persons on their list, and I suspect one or two, who in fact uh, may have tried to get away with it. Right. Well, well, yes. And one of the things, I mean, I, I don't want to put you on a spot, but one of the things we do know was that I believe number 38 on their list was David Hines. And I, I think, you know, persons like David Hines who have been on the list, they ought to be there for living in Guyana at this stage, but we don't see them around. Well, again, you have this, uh, remember the whole court ruling on residency. And mm -hmm. so, um, yes, yes. So you have the issue of residence. You can be on the list. You can be on the, on the voters list, even though you may not live in Guyana. So technically, um, he is covered. Mm -hmm. However, um, to not live in Ghana at all, not even really be active except coming into the, what do you call the election campaign and mm -hmm. then disappearing immediately after the election campaign. is It's it's not an honorable way to behave if you're, you're seeking to represent the people, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It, it, you know, so it's kind of leading people like by remote control from overseas. And, and that is, it, it can be okay, I guess, in the social media, but it's not okay when you want to hold office. You right. have to be here and be with the people and know what their issues are and be accessible to them and be scrutinized by them because mm -hmm. that's what public office is about. Great. You know? Yeah. So, Minister, um, uh, I've listened to uh, a statement you gave uh, a couple of days ago and you expressed some uh, reservations um, with regards to the comments of former president uh, David yes. Granger. Yes. One of the things that has struck me that I would like if you could share with us here, why is it that that you have to fire political appointees? It, isn't it odd? Isn't there some legal recourse? Do you have to, do you, the government going into office, have to fire them? I, I, your, your question is fair and correct. I mean, it is a matter of honor. Political appointees, you have ministers who are elected and they get their offices. But if you're a political appointee, you're, you're appointed as a advisor, as a special project officer, uh, et cetera, there are a range of things, but you're there specifically to serve the minister, to serve the government. You're not there as a public servant with your technical skills and stuff like that. Therefore you come as part of the entourage or baggage of the president. When the government changes, it is the honorable and the right thing to do, and that is to resign because you're no longer serving that president and that administration, which was the, the reason for you being appointed in the first place. So it's, as you correctly said, in, in mature parliamentary democracies, which we are hoping to get to as a mature one, is that um, as soon as a president is voted out or a prime minister is voted out, the political appointees automatically uh, resign. In the mm -hmm. United States, it's automatic that the ambassadors resign, but that's at a very different level than we are. But because in some of the British, uh, the British system is that they don't have to resign when the government changes. But certainly political appointees across the world are the normal practices. Your president's gone, your administration, you were hired to serve is gone. You automatically send in your resignation, you hand in your government assets that you're holding, and so whilst uh, ministers in this case, um, in general, uh, applied and, and did hand in their keys of their offices, uh, handed over their vehicles, although a lot of them are in very bad condition, some are damaged badly, I don't understand that. Um, the political appointees have been the most resistant to complying with this. So. Um, 
and I can only talk from the sector I'm in or, or the area I've been working in right now in the last week and a half uh, is Office of the President. Um, so we've had to write letters advising them that the government quarters they're in, uh, they're to vacate them. Uh, we've had to ask them to hand in their cars that the government cars they own. We've had to ask them to hand over the keys for their offices. And a number have that have been uh, resistant to doing that. So we will have to go further. In fact, we've also sent letters, as I said in that same interview, that if by Monday we don't have resignations, we will now go the next level, which is to terminate. The funny thing, Yog, is that whilst the majority of contracts for the um, political appointees, and I must say, talking to my colleague ministers, that the appointees are everywhere, every single ministry, every single one, and it permeates not only the upper echelons of the ministry, but it permeates all the way through the system. Um, it is it is a level of uh, vulgarity and indecency I, I've never seen, even when we took over in 92 from the then PNC government. Um, so what has happened is that uh, we have sent term termination letters out um, to the persons. Um, what we've discovered, and we have to, of course, we're always legally advised on this, is that a number of the political appointees' contracts, for some strange reason, is not like the normal standard contract that is used in the public service, but which have, in fact, left out, and it's deliberate, left out the clauses of termination. Oh, wow. So you can imagine, <laughs> wow. yeah. there's no there's no uh, termination clause. So how do you terminate? So wow. our Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs has been uh, challenged uh, mm -hmm. to deal with this, and we've been advised accordingly. But mm -hmm. I could not believe that so far we found um, a number of them where there's no termination clause. So how do you terminate? And That's this is a person that has three years, three year contracts that will take them to 2022. Right. Well, that is interesting because I have invited, um, I've asked Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs to join us next Monday, ladies right. and gentlemen. And, and I wanted to ask him that because the other burning question that a lot of the population wants to, to know about is these, some of these contracts have been created or renewed post, post elections, yes. not just, yes. not just post uh, not just post NCM, but post yes, elections. Yes. Yes. And there has to be some liability there. I mean, Minister, I mean no insult to your government when I say this. What we find straight, taxpayers have to fund two sets of public servants, those who are holding on to the old contracts that yes. have been unconscionable in their renewal, yes. and the ones who rightly deserve that spot as well. I'll let you know that... Um... There are contracts that were renewed as late as April oh, wow. this year. Um, some were persons in the system already, but who are getting extensions or new contracts with extensions. A lot of them for the next uh, year, two years, some were three years. And so this is what I'm talking about, the level of depravity uh, 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 mm -hmm. to, to, to do this. It isn't, there, there's, you know, one can call it criminal, and I leave that to AG, to the Attorney General, to determine those legal issues. But there must be something about decency and righteousness. You know by April that you lost the elections. You must have known. I mean, not yeah. you, but Mr. Granger must have had an idea that they lost the elections. And to go and renew contracts in April, some of them weren't issued until May, June. Uh, there's one that was issued... July 30th, for example. <laughs> and so this is a level of, uh, I can't find the right word other than just baseless, a level of depravity. That's the only word I can think of right now that one could dare to do this. And the salaries are very, very um, generous. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I do know that there is a private criminal action from Christopher Ram. Um, against some of the former ministers um, yes. requesting the court's attention to their salaries. Minister, before I hand you over to my co-host, Mr. Leonard Gildari, the, um, as of today, we have noted that a number of the regional personnel, uh, yes. political, uh, political personnel would have been sent home. However, 
uh, some of the news coming out is that all of the persons being sent home by the PPPC are afro guyanese and so this is a race-based decision. Your comments, please. Well, first of all, it's not true as far as I know. Um, not all are afro guyanese some are mixed, uh, like Mr. Parker um, in Region 9, and um, I think the gentleman from Region 2, so that... Um, I think seven were, were sent home and uh, three of them are not afro guyanese The issue is not that we're sending home afro guyanese The issue, the question that must be asked is how is it in a multi-ethnic society that when you look at the REOs and PSs of the former government, they were heavily majority one ethnic group. And therefore, was that acceptable? We're not saying that we're doing the same thing, but it was not okay that the, the public service and persons who held appointments were chosen either because of their, their affiliation. So the first issue for them was political correctness. They had to be up new PNC. Secondly, that there was a preference or apparent preference for those who are of one ethnic group. And so it's unfortunate that that has happened. And it's unfortunate that in trying to clear up and to make sure that one, you have competent people in the system and people who will work towards the achievement of our programs. And so it's not a question of, you know, and of course the issue is always that they, they bring up the afro guyanese issue. Mm -hmm. um, that has been their, um, their, their, the thing that they hold on to all the time when the PNC has got their back against the wall. The point is that when you look at the salaries, and if I were to tell you, give you a couple examples, to say to afro guyanese if this was your government that you felt was presenting you based on the fact that there was a common ethnic interest, how is it okay that um, political appointees were getting $900,000 a month, 200000 this is one salary, 200000 a month duty allowance, $100,000 entertainment allowance, $128,600 for a maid allowance, and $65,000 for gardener. And if you multiply that across the system, because a lot of the political appointees earned around $400,000 up, mm -hmm. then you're talking about the, the, the cost of these appointees, right. cost the, the the taxpayers' money, yes, but also denied poor people, including afro guyanese people, of better conditions. And at the same time, the government didn't deal with the salary increases. They went into government promising a 20% increase in salaries, remember? Right, yes. And, yes. And, and didn't deliver on that. So the attempt to bring everything down to race is a destructive one, and one that tries to obfuscate what really the issues are. This yes, was a government yes. that went in saying, we are here for, are we this time and are we FOSS and whatever they said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did not. I, I wouldn't have a problem with many things if APNU had paid attention to the poor and working people of Ghana, a large percentage of which are afro guyanese I wouldn't have had a problem with that. But when you see the level of greed, what I call greed, it's just greed, Yog and Leonan. Just, just greed. How do you in conscience have this multiplicity. Uh, uh, if you see the amount of political advisors, and, and as I said, they've infiltrated not just uh, what are official political advisors, but mm -hmm. brought on relatives and friends into the public service con uh, system, not as, as public servants, but on contracts, something they used to attack us on before they right. got into government, at salaries of $400,000 for a secretary that has no qualifications. I'm sure a secretary with qualifications would deserve a very good salary, but you're bringing in someone who's your sister, your cousin, performed. this is what is reprehensible about what happened. Mm -hmm. That's what's reprehensible because it denied Amerindian people in the villages, better water supply or better, better jobs or access to jobs or training. It denied afro guyanese also a better way of life and it denied indo guyanese a better way of life. It hurt all the races, not just one race. Mm -hmm. 
Leonard? Yes, uh, thank you very much, dear uh, Minister. Uh, for the, some um, clarifications here. When yes. you, uh, how many cases like this have we found? We know that there was about 20 cases at the Ministry of the Presidency, and we were hearing about 50 plus at the Ministry of Communities. Uh, do we have an idea, ballpark figure, maybe 500, 2,000, 3,000, how many? How many? <laughs> I don't think we've been able to, to add it up yet because I think we're discovering. I thought I found all there was to find, and I found now more today which I now have to go and investigate. Uh, so okay. so that's why I said in the beginning, we're on Discovery Channel. I thought I had all the names <laughs> of those who are political appointees. I'm now discovering there's another layer of political appointees that um, we haven't addressed as yet. And then I think that's the same in other ministries. One minister told me that, who had been in a minister before in her sector and walked back into her ministry and her secretariat <laughs> was now 21 people who are political appointees. Wow. And <laughs> just just on that one, just that one area of that ministry, and her ministry is very big, so that um, she walked in and, and some of them are, are press people, some of you may know. And so, um, but to see 21 political appointees in a minister's office, a minister's secretary is... It's mind boggling. It's absolutely mind boggling. And they weren't working for small amounts. And in addition to that, you have members of parliament who were uh, given advisor posts to, to uh, ministers who uh, were also receiving large duty allowances rather than being paid a salary as a, an advisor. So it is through the system. Um, and as I said, I don't want to take food out of people's mouth but at the same time i think that the because every government does hire political appointees but the issue is that the the extent of it and the um the cost to the treasury was just right. really really unexcept exceptional and so the point leonard is that i think probably within another week we may have a, a better idea and be able to tabulate um it won't take five months like elections did to tabulate uh, what are the real numbers in the ministry, but every sector is impacted on, every yes. single one. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, dear Minister. And I want to bring you across, I know you might pull you back, but across to the parliament, one of the areas uh, as a reporter when I used to cover there, and very interesting yes. is the um, public um, public like accounts, account? yeah, public accounts committee. Now on that committee is going to be, I think the chairperson, it has been the tradition that the chairperson yeah. is always somebody from the opposition. In this particular yes. case, so you have somebody from the opposition, let's say for the first year, that is going to be relooking at 2020, maybe 2019. Yeah. What happens in a case like that uh, uh, when you would be looking back at some <laughs> of the spendings? Because obviously you're looking back at what you're doing and uh, you will be questioning yeah. yourself. How do we deal with this going forward? Well, the public accounts uh, by law and by constitution, by the standing orders and the constitution do go to the opposition of the day. Um, and the Auditor General's reports thus far have been uh, quite expansive on what they've been uncovering. A number of those issues haven't been addressed by the, have, as yet by the public accounts committee. For example, $800 million unaccounted for in the, um, the Hayes program, the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs at the time, the issue to do with drugs and medical supplies, which, um, and those are going back to 2018. So even if the opposition chairs it, they're not in the majority. So remember it, uh, the, the government side, when the government, uh, when we were in opposition, we kind of lose one person because the person would be the chair. Mm -hmm. And so in, in fact, we would have a situation where we would be in the majority, although not in the chair. And I expect that our MPs will be very active and be prepared to deal with us the, and address the issues uncovered by the uh, Auditor General. I mean, as you know, a big one which will come up and doesn't have to wait for a public accounts committee, it can be brought up as a special audit, and that is the Lillian Dow a Hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, that will, that will, I'm sure, reach some prominence in Parliament. And, mm -hmm. and, of course, my last question here uh, before I hand you over back to my host, which is, 
you know, the lots of Guyanese might be uh, wanting to know, uh, you know, you don't want people to come in office and then maybe allegedly or let's say commit crimes against the country and then they walk away with a slap on the wrist. I would love to hear from you going forward as a gov as a government minister, how do we deal with situations like this? We screaming, the people are screaming for justice that uh, somebody may be made or some persons be made examples. Well, I, I think that um, once the, the, the government will, as far as I know, as you saw, we had the rapid um, financial assessment team go out. Mm -hmm. And I think they have uh, uncovered some very interesting things. Some may validate what we already suspected. Others may be completely new. And so um, those will lead, I'm sure, to the next stage um, with audit audit investigations or forensic audit investigations um, and therefore would then be uh, that can be used to bring charges against persons right and I think there, there will be once there's a case that could withstand the scrutiny of the court of course that doesn't determine how the court will rule but it would bring it into the forefront i mean like the one with lewinfield is a completely brand new one because this is now not dealing about financial accountability. This is talking about uh, legal constitutional um, mm -hmm. crime in a sense or anti-constitutional crime. And so um, defrauding and uh, defrauding the rights of the people. So those are going to be really interesting cases that are going to come up. And the law and one is probably a test case to see how the judiciary will handle that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that they're going to be they're going to be quite a few of those that could potentially reach the courts, whether the persons will um, be be finally sentenced. We don't know. We can't predict that. Mm -hmm. But the point is that and we will have to look at um, in legislature how to strengthen issues of public accountability um, and how to strengthen the Integrity Commission Act, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that those who hold public office are uh, under scrutiny and held accountable. And so, I think, so those are areas that we have to go more into. Um, but certainly, I think that that the public out there is much more sensitized. The, the irony of the APNU being in government is if... Um, we thought that people were critical of us when, especially uh, by 2015, by a lot of that what you'll find is that in the last five years, I, I found it fascinating that I think the Guyanese public are much more sensitized as to the power of parliament and what parliament can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. Because uh, under us, sometimes they didn't pay attention to the debates. When the APNU got in there and, and the, the type of debate that went on, people started paying more and more attention and started to learn things. So you go in the supermarket and people come up to me and, and, and say, oh, mm -hmm. they could spend our money on that thing or why they do that, you know? And so people became much more aware. And right. I think it's a very important aspect in any uh, democratic country that the people are one informed of what's going on in parliament, mm -hmm. that parliament is not shrouded in some you know, ivory tower type of thing, that it is there for the people and, and it must represent the people, but also that what we discuss is meaningful and relevant to them. And it is, it, it, and so I'm fascinated about that, those steps that took place and it wasn't encouraged by the APNU, it did not come out with them. It really came out for, through the whole experience of us being in opposition and being very active and making parliament actually the forum for the main, like, the, what I call the amphitheater of the politicians. That's right. where the, the political debate went on instead of on the streets and burning and beating and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. pa uh, Parliament became that body. And so right. I, I hope that that will continue um, to really, because I think it's an important part of building our democracy in our country is to have a, a, a well-functioning parliament, one in Correct. which parliamentarians are, are very well informed and they're yeah. representing the people from the regions and so on to be effective. Right. So, Minister, um, the I want to take you back a little bit, 2015 yeah. and, and before that, uh, yeah. and to come right back to 2015. 2015 and 
previous to 2015, there were a number of uh, political appointees. I believe you yourself would have been an advisor to the president. Yes, I, I, think the, I think the difference that you have drawn to the public was that when PVP uh, uh, lost the elections, you, you walked, everybody walked, they didn't have to be told to leave. Yes. The question though is twofold. One yes, is yes. that are the salaries that these same portfolios uh, being paid pre-2015, are they much higher under APNU? Are they the same? And number two, in 2015, APNU gave themselves uh, an increase in salary, which took mm -hmm. the entire country by surprise. PPP right. had then said that it was going to take the difference and put it in some fund for helping something right. or, or the other. Did, did that continue? Was it managed in the way as promised by the PPP? And what is the PPP's current position on salaries of ministers? <laughs> <laughs> There's a core wall here. <laughs> um, let me go through it pieces. There's several questions and sub questions. One is that um, in relation to our increases were to do with MPs. Mm -hmm. members of, sorry, sorry, excuse me, members of parliament. So although ministers went from what was about four or 500,000 under our time to what were uh, 800, 900, one point something million under the uh, APNU. So that's one issue that, um, but the MPs got a, an increase, I think of $23,755. And we were opposition and that was what we got. And we decided that we were not going to take that increase. And we put it into an account where it was uh, withdrawn um, by the, the clerk of the National Assembly. And that money was kept in account uh, for uh, relief and other forms of help to people, which we use some of that. There's still some of that there. In relation to now, I don't know what will be. I don't know what my salary is, for example. Um, I don't know as yet. But I would make this that, you know, when we went parliament and we saw um, the increases that were gazetted in September 2015, backdated to July 1st, 2015, we were looking at basic salaries and that was of concern, they were large. However, it was never declared then until now that we're in government that that was just the, the icing on the cake because, okay, you're getting your junior minister getting, um, I think it's about 700, between seven and 800,000. Um, but it didn't include um, allowances. And so some, uh, and, and uh, some allowances were like, for example, when I was a, a minister years ago, our entertainment allowance was 5,000 a month, which was a little bit absurd, but you know, that was it. Um, now, uh, $100,000 for entertainment a month. In some cases, there's this allocation of duty allowances, which we're not sure what that means. Usually duty allowance in the public service is when you're expected to be on call 24 seven, or you know, you're, you're available right. at any time. Right. Um, and that's a duty allowance, but the duty allowances were very high. Our duty allowances as ministers uh, years ago was very small. So. It's one thing about the actual basic salary, but it's also the other things, including ministers um, get uh, um, cars drive a car driver, um, uh, a maid service, uh, security at their house, uh, telephone, uh, internet, etc. Um, so that they and they get their electricity bill paid, their um, the telephone bills paid so that their water is not paid, at least mm -hmm. either this government gone or us paid for the water, although the water is probably the cheapest utility. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. But um, it's not just a salary, it is the actual allowances that- um, uh, But, but there in, there, therein I have a little bit of a difficulty. What I know as an accountant, uh, I, I guess a, a couple of the accountants on, on board might, might correct me if I'm wrong, Allowances are taxable. In ah, well, no, wait, stop that. Yes. Some of the allowances are non-taxable. I came across, mm -hmm. I came across in some files, um, duty allowances. Now, these were persons who are, who are getting not a salary because some of them were MPs, for example. 
but they were getting a duty allowance of about 200,000 non-taxable. And wow. I thought that was unusual. And so you get an entertainment allowance that's non-taxable. Whereas I remember in my day, a lot of these things were taxable, but mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but it's, you know, quite a while ago. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, exactly. so, so I just want to, I just want to stick up in there for a moment. So do, um, ladies and gentlemen, allowances, the, the laws have changed. The tax laws have changed. They are, they are taxable by and large. Mm -hmm. Minister, if, if by decree, whether it's a ministerial decree or, or whatever, to make any allowance non-taxable, that is basically uh, pulling the rug out from the from GRA, which is the only legitimate authority for that's illegal, isn't it? Well, my understanding is that if we have to have any kind of change in, say, something from a taxable to non-taxable status, like the duty allowance, that one would have to go to Parliament for an amendment. And I don't personally remember there being such an amendment in Parliament, at least in the, not in the last five years. Right. And so um, I found that a bit surprising. But Perfect. they, um, but it, but you know, it, it's. I wrote a number of times in 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 some newspapers about family and friends, mm -hmm. and I, I now recognize I in the I did a, I think two or three parts on that theme of keeping it all in the family. That was my theme I used. <laughs> um, but really, York, I was just scratching the surface. I had no idea right. of how how wide this uh, family arrangements yeah. were and how generous it was um so it wasn't bringing in okay you have a sister and she's got her qualifications she applies to get a job in the public service she gets a public service job that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about people being brought in who put on contract at way above the scale of people at that level and certainly i think that caused a lot of disruption and and uh discontent in the, the, the public servants who came right. in through the normal ways. Because in talking to some of them um, in the last week, and I've said, how did you all manage this? That a person with less qualifications for you is a political appointee and, and you're getting one quarter of what they're getting. And they said, Minister, mm -hmm. we needed a job. We had to keep our jobs, you know what I mean? Right. But, but it's very hard to imagine that the, 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 right. the range was so wide Correct. The range was so wide. It wasn't an incrementally, okay, you get to a scale 14 and you're 400,000, you get up. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that at all. It was jumping from, and, and it was no, we had when we were in government, um, uh, and Dr. Luncheon was very strict about adhering to it, and that is that your, if you did this kind of job, this was what the scale was, and therefore you got paid within the range of that scale. So mm -hmm. it had a, a scale. But you didn't uh, jump from what was a, 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 a what was it called grade twelve and get Correct. a grade fourteen salary, right? You know? And so there were those things that guided ministers, guided ministries, guided the public service. What I've seen so far is that all of that's just gone. Well, I can tell you, it. What, one of the things that has happened is that many persons downstream. Has rea would have realized that, hey, th this we were getting nothing while some were getting a lot. It was really yeah. a good life for some. And I'll, I'll give you an example, Minister, one that I think you, know, you may not have come across as yet in terms of the comparison. So ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the head of the DPI would have been receiving a million or a million plus in terms of if you put together everything. And wouldn't you know that the... the uh, Leonard, the prime minister's um, 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 representative in Burbies, the man was getting just near two hundred thousand dollars, and so so when they are seeing Mr. Harbison, if you're online, sir, I think you're getting. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're getting just about two hundred thousand dollars, and so Leonard, when when the APNU AFC supporters are seeing this huge disparity, you you've been unfair there, you. You know how difficult it is to manage government propaganda, NCN, and Gina. What's wrong with you? <laughs> well, yes. And, and Minister, there was a case where um, uh, DPI has itself been engaged in creating multiple layers of online newspapers. Has all of that been brought to an end or, or is it continuing? And, and I guess the person was being paid an allowance for each newspaper that they created. 
Yeah, I, I, I leave that for you to call uh, Minister McCoy to be on your program as uh, he is within the, as you know, the Prime Minister's um, portfolio mm -hmm. includes mm -hmm. quite a lot of heavy matters, unlike the former Prime Minister who we called Robert Stamp, but um, the present Prime Minister, Brigadier Mark Phillips, um, is dealing with telecommunications, dealing with information and communication, mm -hmm. dealing with the um, the environment sector, etc. So um, there are quite a number of areas under him. Right. And uh, uh, Mr. McCoy, Minister McCoy is assisting him with the information and communication mm -hmm. so that Mr. Khan and others, some were board appointees who were getting well paid. So you have anomaly, very strange things in the uh, information sector of a managing director and executive director uh, whatever you call it, chief election, chief, chief executive officer. Mm -hmm. um, so there's these layers at the top. That it was very top heavy, yes. very top heavy. And where I'm sure there's some uh, PR companies that we uh, uncovered in some other things who uh, probably were helping to put some of these newspapers together too. So I'm sure that... Um, so there was double and triple dipping then. Yeah. So uh, Minister McCoy, I'm sure, will have his revelations. Great. I don't want to steal his thunder. I'm <laughs> sure he will have fun with that. But it, it the the uh, office of the prime minister was full of political appointees as well, mm -hmm. um, and so a number of them uh, have. We their... Yeah, we will certainly talk to them, Minister. Just you mentioned we both mentioned a little bit about GCOM. Can I ask you this? It might not be within your direct remit, but with your experience, you may certainly be able to answer. My understanding is that Mr. Clement Mingo still goes to work for 30 minutes every weekday at some Region 5 um, office. I don't know whether it's true, but is there any overwatch on, on, on the Secretariat's expense now that elections are over? Well, the commission is still in place, you know. And so I would hope that our commissioners uh, one we've lost, that is Mr. Robeson Ben, who is now a technocrat minister and the Minister of Home Affairs. But I'm hoping that our other two commissioners are still keeping an eye on the shop because the commission has not dissolved and the chairman is still there. I don't believe the chairman should be um, insensitive and just feel what well, the declaration is done and so the matter is over. It ha isn't over, as you correctly pointed out. Uh, Mr. Mingo should not be anywhere near GCOM, including whether it's in Region 5 or in Timbuktu. Right. He needs to be sent home. And uh, if if uh, the chair doesn't want to send him home, she can suspend him, you know, um, interdict him. Until, uh, but it, it, he, he cannot remain there with what he's done to this country. And and Mr. Lowenfield, um, I, I saw that the DPP said that she was not going to drop the criminal charges, although he asked or there was some request for that. And, um, then, and, and certainly the, the chairman must recognize these are two people, particularly one that's formally charged, mm -hmm. that um, they should not be given full reign in the place. They should be, and I understand in the public service, and again, Maybe GCOM is running on a different track, but in the public service, if you are charged with a crime um, and not a you know a small crime, not a traffic ticket, mm -hmm. that you are automatically almost uh, suspended or interdicted <laughs> with one third of your salary until you're proven innocent or guilty. Pending and so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how he continues in that in that. Uh, in that organization without any consequences whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It just boggles my mind, but I can't tell Chairman Justice Singh what to do, but she knows the law a hundred times better than I do. Right. And therefore she should do what is right. We've got the declaration. The parties will be sending in their names. Mm -hmm. um, GCOM has to write a letter to the clerk saying, here are the lists that have been extracted, the MPs have been extracted and let us get on with that part. But that doesn't leave GCOM alone to, right. to, and, be, and Minister, to be unaccountable can, to anybody. Can you, can you, uh, can you just uh, expand a little bit on President Ali's promise for a forensic review of um, GCOM? 
Well, I know that he's made that. I'm not aware of what are the arrangements he's putting in place, but if I know him that that is the direction where he is going to focus his attention. But uh, the forensic audit on GCOM is going to be a very important one. Mm -hmm. um, I assume that um, as maybe, um, as, we, as you know, there are two major things we are dealing with now. One is COVID-19, um, mm -hmm. where the co cases are going up quite rapidly in the last uh, three weeks, four weeks, and also the state of the economy, yes. which is um, very bad. And mm -hmm. so those two issues and how do we get the economy stimulated and get, get it up and Correct. running again? Correct. So those two issues, as well as the third issue, which right. is just like a layer on top of that or along with that, exactly. and that is getting government established, getting the ministers in, the ministries working, getting the RDCs established, the parliament established, looking at the boards and, the, and what changes need to be made in the board so that the apparatus of the state is now in place to do what it has to do. And gotcha. so those are like three, what do you call, parallel tracks we're running on. Neither one is more important than the other. They're all Correct. equally important um, because if Correct. we don't, uh, if we don't, and, and again, I talked about Discovery Channel in COVID-19, um, we knew when, uh, Pres well, Irfan Ali at the time had put up the national res COVID-19 response um, on March the 28th because we didn't see anything happening with the government in preparations for the pandemic. And then we had the first case. Um, and, and various members of the committee have written uh, from time to time about how badly the government was doing in preparing for and addressing COVID. As um, the briefing sessions the president had a week ago, Monday with stakeholders and then further uh, meetings and the setting up of the new COVID group and so on. Mm -hmm. We are discovering it is it is it is so bad what happened. Whatever we imagined mm -hmm. was nothing near what it is. You right. know, you, you can imagine that there was one yeah. one machine for testing and being told all the time there's only one machine for testing, and yet there were other machines around that hadn't even come out of their boxes. Right. The level of inefficiency, um, not uh, bringing in tests and uh, the level of drugs and so on that were purchased, practically nothing. Right. And so it, it is uh, the reason why we're seeing this big increase with COVID is really we're paying the consequences of the first five months, unfortunately paralleling the, the elections, mm -hmm. um, with really bad, poor uh, management, policy, et cetera, and just figured that you could just come out with lockdown issues and that would solve it. And that wasn't all. You right. know, so President Irfan is really, Ali has really set up a kind of multi-stakeholder group because you have to deal with agriculture, you have to deal with food relief, you have to deal with of course. how do you open back the economy, how do you balance back all these different issues while keeping people safe, how and when do you open schools, how do you do these things so mm -hmm. that there's some normalcy in life at the same time that you're protecting people. And therefore, I heard you at the very beginning when I came on you talk about wearing masks. Mm -hmm. As you know, today, the president had announced that we have a case in cabinet, um, Minister Todd. Um, and so all of us were tested for COVID today, and right. we all have to wait for the results. So President Ali made a very important uh, speech um, to, the, to the public because we felt that we needed to be accountable and transparent. Mm -hmm. um, we have a person, a, a minister, who was uh, did get exposed by being with someone who he didn't know at the time was positive. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he was sitting up next to many of us who didn't know either. And right, so of course. when of it was course. found that he was tested and positive, he immediately informed the president, and then uh, we all had to be tested. And I want to say to the public, I was tested. I'm here. I'm fine. Uh, it's a little uh, bit uncomfortable. We didn't see you cough any time, so I think you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I <don't laughs> know. We're waiting for the test results tomorrow. We're <laughs> hoping for the test results. In the meantime, all the ministers and the president, vice president, the prime minister were all tested, and we wait for our results. And in the interim, we are doing self-isolation for 24 hours or whenever the test will be mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. And hopefully all of us are, are, are good. But to say to the public, Yog, that um, 
the test itself is a little bit awkward because it feels if you know something's going up your nose and when it comes down when they take it out it burns a little bit but it's not it's not painful it's not worse than having like a, a pinch uh, you know a rather strong pinch um but the test is is as i said awkward but it's not for a woman and i'll say this only to the women women listeners for those of us who gone through childbirth it ain't anything like that this is mild this is mild for those of us who know what childbirth is this is like a prick you know having a needle or something so yeah. don't be afraid of the test the second thing yoga and leonard is that please help to insist as you were in the beginning of the program to tell people to wear a mask people are not wearing masks they wear it as decoration around their neck they're wearing it with their nose showing some of them you know have it like a scarf um and then because the bars are closed the guys are drinking all along the road in the pickup trucks and along the seawall and and other places and they're sitting in the tray of a truck or a canter on the ground with no mask on and right. drinking so i mean we will certainly to, continue yeah we need to tell our people to really be careful really mm -hmm. be careful and, and we had we had dr frank anthony on monday so we did discuss the the covid-19 um uh, yes. martin detail minister but, just uh, some I, i'm not look you're the minister of parliamentary affairs and governance so i have to ask you what's that minister <laughs> of finance <laughs> yes we want to ask that go ahead <laughs> Well, you know the Constitution. The Constitution says that wherever the, the, the sector does not have a, a minister, the president is the minister. Mm -hmm. And so um, if there's no, until there's a minister of finance, the president remains the, the person responsible for finance of the country. Mm -hmm. And of course, because of, of oil and gas and other areas of our natural resources, the president has oversight whilst there is a minister running the administration of that sector. But because this is a critical area for the economy and a number of policy issues, as you know, in relation to oil and gas, this will have the attention of the office of the president. Right. And so I wouldn't get too excited about that. Um, so Mr. Right. Ashby Singh is not available or he's not? You're, you know. it. Yeah, go ahead. you're really trying to you're trying to pick my mouth no yeah yeah you're trying to pick your mouth is he? You I, I, I can't answer that only to you say that happens. please remember our president is a macroeconomist himself in his own right um and so is mr jagdu a macroeconomist there are not well, many macroeconomists well, let me let me claim let me claim total innocence for asking that i'm a finance man so i can always apply uh, yes <laughs> Minister, the next question. Um, uh, when do you expect uh, National Assembly to, to be in session? And is there any word about what the PPP is thinking about the speaker uh, that is that you can make available? I know you might still be in consideration, but... No, I, I can't uh, speak on the speaker because I'm not sure who are all the candidates that are running uh, in that area as yet. Um, and I have... I, because we're trying to bring in a budget for 2020, and then remember, we'll probably have to bring in a budget for 2021. So really we're talking at a budget that's just what, what, four months left, five mm -hmm. months left. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to get very quickly a budget in. Um, and I know the work has started on that and the work is going quite rapidly in that area, considering what is the normal rather long process to prepare a budget in our country. So I think that um, we should be able to have a sitting, I'm hoping by the end of August, I had said it, it could be held in two weeks. Um, well, that's what I said last week. Right. Um, but I'm hoping that between the, the third and fourth week of August, we would have a sitting and we will probably then move rapidly um, to uh, a budget to the inaugural speech of the president, because remember the president addresses yes. parliament and this is a new parliament. So he would have to come in and address the parliament as well as have the uh, budget uh, submitted for debate. And remember you have before that, the constitutional agencies budgets have to come in before as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I see that in the, even if we don't start uh, until the end of August, 
I think that we're going to have a really busy uh, schedule of Parliament between September and the end of the year. There's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff we have to do, including uh, pieces of legislation that have to be changed. We've made promises on the taxes and stuff like that. We're going to have to see how to bring those in to right. um, to free up the economy more and to, to release some sectors from some of the burdens they've faced in the last five years. And exactly. Minister, yes, and Minister, yeah. if I may, have you, have you guys been able to look at, uh, uh, maybe just have an initial look at the ministry and the wage bill as compared to 2015? Uh, how much have it increased or ballooned? Um, I, I'm not able to speak on that. I know that it did, and I know that there, there are ministers who could speak more authoritatively. I, I haven't seen the total figures as yet, but I could say from uh, the, the wage bills in the ministries are heavy. Um, so we may, because a number of them have, uh, have contracts, some have resigned, they will have to get their benefits. There are others who have taken leave and who, are, who will be entitled to certain benefits, even though they are political appointees. Mm -hmm. So that we still have a wage bill. Um, a number of them have been told that um, they're given one month notice because they're on contract. Mm -hmm. um, and so that doesn't mean we pay them, but there are a number of those kind of things where you end up, right. you'll have that, that well, wage bill from 2019 right. might be very similar for the end of 2020. And but let me, let me just ask you this, uh, sorry to take us our conversation right back to the discussion on salaries and so forth. In your, uh, in your last week's um, presser, you did say that okay. places like the Forestry Commission is broke, bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that staffers would not have been paid for a month or, or, there, or, or two. Question for you. <laughs> so while public servants, sections of public servants were not being paid. Yes. Were the ministers and the political appointees being, were they payment up to date? Yes, of course. Yes. She said of In course. Fact, <laughs> of course, <laughs> they were paid um, as MPs, oh as far as I know, MPs who are not ministers and um, were not paid after the dissolution of parliament. And that has been traditionally the way, according to the constitution and the laws, so that if you're an MP, you wouldn't be paid after parliament is dissolved. However, uh, ministers have been paid um, right up to when the declaration would have been made. Minister, um, in terms of Soku and Sarah, there, there's been a lot of comments. I know former President Barry Jagde would have been himself uh, lash out, as we say in Guyana, against the head of, of, uh, of, of the um, Asset Recovery Agency. Yeah. But so cool. And, and the, this whole drug thing, as you know, the recently we got reports of a ship, uh, of a container in, in Germany. Is there any thought of your government for being very, very stern and strong in, in, in the, the, the whole drug overwatch and, and curtailing of that? I know the U.S. must probably be on your backs to say we need to get on with this program as well. But let's make a distinction between Soku and Sara. Soku mm -hmm. was originally formed under us mm -hmm. prior to 19, uh, 2015 because of the anti-money laundering legislation. And so Soku is particularly focused on anti-money laundering and um, apprehending, stopping, preventing, and uh, taking, charging people and sentencing oh, people. Minister, sorry to, sorry to cut in. If Soku has been so engaged in money laundering, how come all of these people who have been living in the U.S. from 2015 to now, earning their salaries in Guyana, and those salaries not being reported to the U.S.? Not being reported to the U.S. Isn't something wrong there? Yes, of course. I mean, Soku was designed to be a part of the Guyana Police Force. Mm -hmm. It is a special unit within the Guyana Police Force. It was never meant to be politically managed by the Minister of Home Affairs or the Minister of Public Security. It was meant to be a criminal investigation body that was highly specialized. And they brought down uh, different people to train, etc., and so one of the things we're going to have to do on the anti-money laundering issue is to re review all the many, many amendments that Mr. Williams brought, including ensuring that we um, properly 
put into the legislation a format for SOKU mm -hmm. so that it becomes more institutionalized and it has a life that is, uh, that is beyond uh, the kind of thing that happened in the last five years. Sarah is completely different kettle of fish. Um, we do need to have a, a legislation that deals with state assets and the protection of state assets. There's no doubt about that. And we need to have the Integrity Commission Act become, also have more teeth in it to deal with those who are not compliant in, um, uh, in the integrity of their public life that include the, the assets and their, um, their earnings, et cetera, whatever they gain. The initial view right now is that, that SARA should be dismantled. That is not that the issue of state assets recovery should not be dealt with and that it shouldn't be accommodated in some form of legislation. But the State Asset Recovery Act, as is, is inoperable and or one in which you have a person who is in charge of SARA who can at any time suddenly take over the powers of the Commission of Police or the DPP or the Chief of Immigration or the head of GRA. This is absurd. It's a, it's a level of legislation that seems to have been written by a madman that you could think that these are post holders that hold a lot of, uh, some are constitutional post holders like the DPP and an executive director of SARA can, can take over those powers. And so the legislation itself is, is atrocious and needs to be either totally revamped or that one closes, shuts that and repeals that and then starts start again in a different way. But Sarah has nothing to show in the years it's been formed with highly paid persons, including- well, it, did. It, 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 it did, right? It has some photos of, of having some of the PPP persons um, parading <laughs> up and down that never- Oh, I mean, I mean, yes, of course, going to court, yes. Yeah, and and yeah. going in and out of Soku and taking photographs. Correct. No, but they didn't, they didn't ever, they went to court on the, the case that they never pursued. Mm -hmm. um, and it, all it was was a political sham. It was to embarrass people and to 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 make it seem as if PVP had done something terrible. But mm -hmm. in fact, um, it it fell in it fell on on deaf ears in a sense. All so right. that I'm what we're saying is that there there is room for state asset recovery, and I'm sure under this government, uh, we will need to do that because I hear of various assets of the state are. Um, not being declared at this point or not coming to the fore. But also you have a lot of state assets that have been uh, sold for nothing, sold right. uh, all sorts of deals and stuff like that. Right. Uh, and particularly in land and um, uh, for so-called so development and so on. So yeah. the, those are issues we need to protect. The, the state's asset is not just, mm -hmm. you know, whether they stole a house or they, they have bought a house or whatever. It's really about... Right. Um, major areas. And so I personally think that uh, a state asset recovery uh, provisions in the law are critical to protect the property of the Guyanese people um, mm -hmm. and therefore must be given the kind of legislative weight that's required, but not necessarily creating this superstructure with persons who were, a number of them were over 80 years old, and I don't need to batch people who are 80 right. years old and over, because I may be heading there in, in not not in the near time, but in the future. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, Minister. So, you know, you, they did nothing. They did nothing uh, to protect because they came on a whim that there were all these assets being stolen and they mm -hmm. didn't find it, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I I know I promised you, Leonard, I promised Minister 30 minutes and it's gone on to about an hour or more. Minister, yes, I'm sorry to keep you so long. <laughs> no, sorry to keep you so long. She it has been a pleasure. Though. I have a, uh, another question that slipped me when we were talking about parliamentary and ministers and stuff. My question is twofold. One is that in January 2020, I think okay. the High Court, um, the Court of Appeal upheld uh, a high court decision that ministers Keith Scott and Felix yeah. were unlawfully occupying a seat in parliament. Yes. Will the PPP government 
uh, uh, collect back those salaries for the unlawful time spent in parliament. If the court so decree, then you cannot go against the courting. And that's one and two. My last question to you, Minister, given all that you have been experiencing over a week and a half, how difficult is it for Minister Gale to share to walk that line between uh, uh, the opposition crying up um, victimization vis-a-vis -vis doing what is right for the people of Guyana? <laughs> well, because, because of the way I operate, I, I, um, I do try to walk the thin line as well as I can. Um, and that's why some days I get into trouble, even sometimes with my own comrades. But um, I believe in what is right and what is legal, what is lawful. And I also believe strongly that there has to be inclusivity. But I'm not prepared to, if people have done wrong things, that they should get away with it. And I, I, what I find offensive in what I've been seeing in the last week is the fact that APNU fooled a lot of their supporters about um, mainly on the ethnic issue, that if they allowed the PPP to come in, that they would um, be allowing one ethnic group to take over. And a lot of people fell for that, but they weren't. They, their, their supporters didn't know what they were doing behind the scenes. Everyone was filling their own pockets, and and so you have leaders of the APNU AFC. I don't know if Mr. Granger just shut his mind to what was going on, but how could it? How could you fool the people like that? And so, for me, having gone through politics for a long time, is that, and I know that um, for the leaders of the party is that we have to make sure that we do things the best that we can with what we have and that we don't fall into the same pitfalls as AP and UPNC did and that we have to make sure that we walk the straight and narrow line. It won't always be easy, but we have to be able to uh, improve the condition of lives of our people. And so sometimes it's always a a difficult thing in politics, internal politics, but I believe that that with our leaders that um, we're going to try as much as possible to make sure that what comes first is the people and the development of our nation. There are always going to be persons at different levels who may feel that their personal aggrandizement is more important, but I believe that um, our political philosophy of of being able to develop our nation and putting the people first is one that will guide us to make sure that um, not too many people, um, how do you call it, um, step out of line. So, uh, uh, is the minister, minister, uh, if I may, Yogi there? Yeah, one second, Leonard. Uh, uh, just, minister, just to bring you back, the Court of Appeal decision, any thought on that? Oh, yeah. Um, my view is that the the, 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 the appeal has it has to be it has it has to be acted on. If you're unlawfully holding a position, and they knew that all the time that they were doing that, then I mean I'm sure that you know in politics it's a funny thing. Sometimes um, people can negotiate uh, for different things at other levels, but this is a court order that they went to the court to appeal the decision and they lost. Yes, and they lost the decision. And therefore, they have to comply. And I hope that Mr. Granger is telling Mr. Scott and Mr. Felix to reimburse the, the state for the salaries they unlawfully accepted all these years, including even after the court case. What I find reprehensible, Jürgen Lennart, is, OK, the case, as you correctly said, was uh, ruled in January 2020. Mm -hmm. What happened after January 2020? Right. Aren't you going to do the honorable thing and say, okay, stop my salary. Don't let us go further. And I think that's why Mr. Ram, Christopher Ram was taking up the issue. I heard, I, I may be wrong, yeah. but he mm -hmm. was taking up the issue to say, well, let's deal with from January to now, whatever the date he decided to do it, because there was a court order that said, you're not there. So even if you put aside the five years for now, what were you, what was Felix and Scott doing from January to up to when the the, the, uh, the yeah. elections were declared they Correct. should have not been receiving any salary no no facilities no no vehicle no no driver no payment of electricity bill and telephone bills thank you 
But it's I, a, so I, I, I will have yeah. fun investigating that part to see if um, <laughs> what what happened, what exactly happened. My my Great. Sherlock Holmes, my Sherlock Holmes uh, interest in this will get titillated. I'm sure you. It's one of the things on my list. It's one of the things on my list to look at. <laughs> Great. <laughs> And it's it has been a pleasure to have you here. Leonard, you have a last question, yes. I presume. Yes, uh, very two, two questions very quickly, Minister. Sure. I, I want to ask you, could you tell us a little about uh, some of the faces that we're going to see in the National Assembly? And uh, two, uh, maybe a little expansion on some of the legislations likely uh, to be presented, maybe not this year, but as soon as possible. Um, and, and unfortunately, Minister, let me be the speaker. You only got two minutes to go. So. <laughs> That's okay. I'm used to the speaker. At least you're more, you're more easy to deal with than the speaker. <laughs> um, to do with new faces, yes, there will be some new faces. We do have to, um, some geographic MPs and stuff. And uh, I think you've seen from the cabinet that there are lots of new faces, quite a new number of new faces there, completely new. And also in those who were MPs before who are now ministers who are young as well. So um, we're quite pleased with the fact that we're, we're a young, energetic cabinet, except for the older heads like me. Mm -hmm. And in the legislative um, agenda, there are a number of areas, one, of, some of which, as I mentioned, that we have to rectify bills that the PNC brought up and brought in in the last five years, like the ones on VAT, on taxes, on yes. um, uh, taxes on the mining sector and stuff like that, as well as um, bills that were extremely controversial, the Cybercrime uh, Act, which included sedition in it. And uh, we had taken out sedition when we, we, we removed sedition from our laws when we got into government in 92, between the first government. And to see it re put back in legislation in 2014 was horrific. Um, so the cybercrime issues have some areas the anti-terrorism bill has some issues. It has 14 times the death, death penalty, uh, for example. I'm just picking some things out quickly. The, uh, Mr. Jagger has already spoken about the Natural Resources Fund uh, bill or act because it was made an act in January um, 2019 that has flaws in it. We have to look at um, a number of new pieces of legislation, higher purchase, for example, so there, there are a number of issues we have to look at. Um, there's the issue of uh, what the climate change issue and how we'll deal with that. And a number of bills that were passed by us, a lot of them were not put into um, operation um, or not as, as effective as they should be right. based on the boards that were set up. So some yeah. are administrative in having good boards and strong boards that will mm -hmm. implement them and others were actually problems with the legislation itself. I may right. be forgetting. You remember there there were made amendments to, I think it was the Broadcasting Act. Mm -hmm. And then you have issues with the Telecommunications yes. Act as well. Yes. So those are, those are bills that were passed in the last parliament that we have to review. We were critical of a number of them and critical of a number of areas of those areas, of those bills and acts. And we have to go back and probably bring uh, amendments in, or in some cases, um, like I said, the SARA bill, that, that really has to be just repealed and a new bill written over to do with state assets. Right. Of course, there are other things to do with oil and gas, like the local content policy. Mm -hmm. those, those ones are outstanding from the last parliament. Minister, it's been a pleasure. Our program yes. is out of time now. It's been a real yes, pleasure to have you. And we look forward to continuing the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been uh, our honor to have Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance, Honorable Gail Teixeira, in Room 592 tonight. I just want to let you know that on Friday night, when is the next time we're going to have Room 592, we, ex we will be having in our room uh, the, His Excellency, the High Commissioner of, of um, Britain, the uh, British High Commissioner to Guyana um, will be joining us here. It's 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 his closing stint, right, Leonard? Yes, it is. Uh, he has a few yes. more days. He will be leaving, and so we will be having a diplomat in our room 592 on Friday night, as well as after the diplomat departs our room, we will be having Mr. Dominic Gaskin in good. our room 592 for a Friday night discussion. So we're looking ahead to a good discussion. Next Monday, Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Mr. Anil Nandalal. 
And ladies and gentlemen, it's been good to have you here in room 592. Minister, once again, we thank you very much and we look forward to continuing the discussion with you in the near future. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you're joining us from, it's been a pleasure to have you in room 592. Do stay safe. Remember, you are as safe as you want to be. Follow all the guidelines of COVID and stay out, stay away, six feet away from people, wear your masks and ensure you wash your hands. So ladies and gentlemen, do have a great night wherever you're joining us from. Remember, say a prayer for this beautiful country of ours. It is still the best place on earth. Thank you very much. Be safe. Bye-bye now. COVID-19 tips sponsored by Dexo. One, practice social distancing. Two, wear your mask when leaving the house. Three, wash your hands regularly for 20 seconds using our deck soap. Four, cover your nose and mouth with a disposable tissue or flex elbow when you cough or sneeze. Choose deck soap for that extra cleanliness. Deck soap is affordable and available nationwide. Kaichur Radio. Covering Guyana from coast to coast. Demerara and Essequibo 99.1 FM. Burbies 99.5 FM. Kaichur Radio.